So now we're starting. Hello to everybody. Um, my name is Miko Eksekutovic. I'm the curator, CEO of Terma Art and VP for Strategic Development and Culture at the Terma Group. I'm delighted uh, that you all could join us here today to discuss the idea of the human city. The human city is the topic of the green paper that we have just published as Terma Group. And um, this is a paper that uh, is just the start of our thinking. So it's not a paper that, uh, that is basically closing the discussion, but for us personally, it's, uh, um, uh, it, it's a first step summarizing what we have learned uh, in the past years, but especially in the past months since the pandemic started and affected all our lives uh, everywhere in the world. Um, Hans Ulrich, uh, in one of our previous Wellbeing Culture Forum sessions, said that now it's a renegotiation of how we are going to live together, mm. not only, of course, with social distancing that we need for architecture, for the design of future cities, but how we are going to live together in terms of actually addressing the extinction crisis. And um, that leads me to a topic that I think we all um, now experienced that while we are socially distanced, uh, we learn how interconnected we are, more interconnected than ever. Uh, a virus that is actually a part of our biology uh, was able to completely change our habits, our everyday lives, affecting all uh, our families and uh, all our uh, all our uh, societies, um, so in the micro and in the macrocosmos, and uh, we learned that our design is not really prepared to answer these questions yet. Yeah, so we did incredible progress in the past 30 years in the virtual world, but if we look at our real world, this progress is probably uh, going simply in the wrong direction. We learned um, uh, and this is why we also started the Wellbeing Culture Forum, that the topics well-being uh, and culture uh, don't receive the right attention uh, for our societies. We also learned that uh, if we are not well, uh, we are probably already sick. And when we are sick, we are probably already moving towards extinction. Yeah. We also learned, this is a very personal uh, thing, that uh, we are interconnected uh, uh, inside and outside. Yeah? So when, when we are creating a design that is basically not able to sustain a healthy population with a high immunological resistance, uh, that's one big problem. But on the other hand, this design, when it's consuming our planet, it's another big problem. So. We have created, you know, the form of organization of humans. This is also one of the main um, fundaments of the Green Paper, is that the city is the main organization and it will be even stronger in the years to come. And this form of organization must be sustainable for us as a population and it must be also sustainable for the planet that is hosting the cities. Yeah? So, we have to get back into a balance that, uh, that we have unfortunately completely lost. Yeah. So this Wellbeing Culture Forum um, uh, had already four uh, iterations. This is now the fifth discussions. We started with the social culture of cities as a very important topic. <laughs> then in partnership with the Serpentine Gallery, we did the topic about art and architecture. Then with Art Basel, Mark Spiegler, and with the Manchester International Festival, the Culture of Life events, which is another big topic, uh, obviously, for us. And then with the British Council, this is also a long-term partner now, as we're supporting their presentation at the Architectural Biennale and, and also the Biennale di Arte. Uh, we did the session on the 29th of July about architecture of health and happiness. We thank our partners very much for their continued support because uh, today it's all about our thoughts and our ideas uh, and how they help us to, to recreate uh, our own very own product uh, that I will introduce in a second, but also um, how they help us to spread 
the idea um, uh, that uh, that is about not anymore only our product, but that's also about the cities itself. Um, uh, speaking about spreading the idea, the design platform um, is our media partner here that is live streaming this talk and the other talks, and we're extremely thankful also to design for this opportunity. Um, introducing the, the green paper uh, that we have published that you can uh, see on our website, uh, um, I want to highlight uh, the United Nations report that uh, you all know that 65 million people a year, uh, 65 million people, this is, you know, this is uh, almost the population of Germany, um, uh, are joining the community of cities, are organizing themselves in cities. So um, uh, to, uh, up to two, 2050, we will have 2.5 billion more people expected to move into the urban environment. And, uh, and this all leads us to, as it, so we, we can already predict that if we scale uh, what we have created until now into the future, we are species, we don't have to discuss probably climate change because we will already extinct ourselves before um, because our populations will be weak and they will consume basically all the natural resources. Um, our CEO and my very good friend and partner, Robert Hanea, he, um, he put it one of his, uh, one quote um, that I want to, uh, it's from one of the other well-being culture forums where he said, we are a product of a connected nature. We are not standing next to nature. We are nature. We are in a, every way a product of it. And I believe that we disconnected ourselves from this universal truth. It's very interesting when you look into the cities. Um, uh, what Robert Hania is uh, saying here is that when we look into the cities, we are basically, uh, we created an environment where the only natural part remains us as biological forms of life. And everything else is basically only decoration. But our bodies were created in 200,000 years of evolution in a constant interaction with a natural environment. This kind of uh, design uh, um, uh, approach to have this under consideration is probably one of the biggest, um, uh, one of the biggest challenges for, for the design of future cities. So um, everybody of you here, and we are extremely thankful for you to be here. I said this already in my preparation. Uh, talk that for us, uh, this is the collection of ideas, uh, the collection of ideas and collection of people that, that have a similar motivation and that uh, are working in a similar direction. So it doesn't have to be controversial discussions, although they can be, absolutely. But for us, it's extremely important to learn from, from all of you and also to share our knowledge with you. And I want to introduce now the panelists that I'm extremely thankful to participate in this talk. So I want to start with uh, you, Stefano Boeri. You were introduced by the great Hans Ulrich Oberst. Uh, you were already participating in one of our talks and we wanted to have you um, uh, here in, the, in this conversation also as one of the first to review our green paper, The Human City. You yourself, um, I don't have to introduce you too much because everybody knows you as the president of the Triennale in Milano and um, also as the creator of the vertical forest building in, in Milano and uh, one of the maybe um, strongest motors of an urbanization based on uh, the reconnection to plant life. Yeah, We have our common friend that is also in our advisory board, Stefano Mancuso from Italy. I'm very happy that, uh, that you are here uh, uh, and that you are participating in our conversation. Um, then uh, I would like to introduce Annie Hood, uh, the co-founder and chef executive of Well Intelligence. Uh, you are working um, uh, in the um, well-being um, sector as one of the maybe most innovative protagonists and I'm very much looking forward to uh, to uh, learn from you. Uh, what is your take on the on the integration of well-being in in uh, the human cities? Thank then, you, uh, very nice to have you. Uh, 
So, so Hai Khan, um, that works uh, for many years with Google. Uh, we, we met, uh, I think the first time, I don't know if you remember, but uh, through the project that you have supported uh, uh, with the Serpentine Gallery, this amazing project, um, uh, the Deep Listener from Jakob Kutz-Stensen, that is participating in our next uh, uh, Wellbeing Culture Forum, where uh, the experiment of uh, connecting the augmented reality with the park in the Kensington Gardens uh, is uh, something that really blow my mind and showed me how uh, powerful it is, this technology that just you now started basically to exist, to implement and to use also as a part of our reconnection to nature actually. So how technology can bring us back to nature and I think I'm extremely happy to you know, learn more from you about this project. Then uh, Ben Rogers. Um, ben Rogers is, yeah, I can almost say a partner of our group. Uh, uh, our presence that is extremely strong uh, in UK, I think wouldn't be possible and thinkable without you and without your activity. Ben Rogers is the director of the Center of London, urbanist, researcher, writer, speaker. And yeah, I'm very happy that you join us and that we will discuss this common uh, topic. And uh, I'm also very happy that you uh, introduced us to Denny uh, Shikandaraja. I hope I say your name right. Um, Shikandaraja, uh, the chef ex uh, executive of Oxfam in Great Britain. Um, this is an organization that is actually, um, in my opinion, um, Basically, uh, every organization should be a little bit Oxfam. Every even uh, for-profit organization should be a little bit like Oxfam. I think the reconnection between non-profit and profit, uh, so to use the best of both, both worlds, this is exactly what Oxfam is doing, uh, able to motivate uh, corporates uh, on an international level, but also humans on an uh, on a broad level to uh, to participate in this uh, endeavor and uh, also to do lobby for the people that are disconnected, forgotten. And, uh, and this is maybe something that we all have to uh, understand that uh, and through COVID-19, basically learning through the virus, this was for me for in the last three months really uh, a big topic, learning through the virus that it doesn't matter if you know you are rich and uh, healthy if your neighbor is poor and unhealthy you will die yeah because your neighbor is a part of you it's a part of basically your body so i think we have to learn from organizations like you and from your work and uh, i'm also very much looking forward and i'm very thankful that you're participating in this talk then um the um very well known leading creator design consultant writer jane witters um, that is also working already with us, and we are extremely happy about this, um, to the topic of water. Um, Jane is also um, working in between the different sectors of private and public institutions as brand consultants, uh, but also uh, curating programs and acclaimed exhibitions at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Royal Academy of Arts. And the curatorial take on, um, on the world, actually, it's a very new perspective, uh, recently developed in the last 20 years, but we learned that the curatorial perspective is a very strong perspective because it keeps the mind extremely open and working together with artists uh, is, um, uh, keeps us um, not forgetting, you know, not, not specializing too much and uh, keeps a very broad perspective. And this broad perspective is something that that we forget sometimes specializing, like uh, this is probably the story of, of, of the next speaker, a professor, um, Dr. Jörg Spitz, that worked over 25 years as the head of the Department of the Nuclear Medicine in Wiesbaden, and uh, then um, after his retirement discovered the holistic approach of medicine and uh, and then started first to graduate in preventive medicine and nutrition. And since then, out of several books, has hundreds of thousands of followers uh, on YouTube. And is basically preaching the common sense of prevention. And I'm very happy that we have you here also, uh, uh, Professor Jörg Spitz, uh, to, um, to um, open 
uh, the discussion in the direction of health and medicine and how a healthy city can help us uh, to, to sustain. Thank you very Thank much you for being there. So the first question um, uh, is uh, to, to, to you, Stefano, if you could maybe um, give us a short introduction into how you are connected to the topic of well-being and how you practice your work is, um, is helping to realize what we try to, uh, to propose with our green paper on the one hand and where you see the biggest obstacles in your work and in bringing it really to life. Thank you so much, Nikolai. So I tried to share the screen just to, uh, and I think it's possible. I don't know if you see. Do you see? Yes. The list of so basically, I'd love to start with some very, very, let's say, simple uh, slide. That's more or less is. Uh, the urban Pangea, so it's a distribution of uh, uh, cities in the planet, uh, megalopolis, metropolis, big, middle-sized, small cities. Uh, but if we could imagine that we could concentrate all what is city in one unique part of the planet, probably we will not cover more than 3% of the surface of the emerging lands. Uh, it's true, absolutely true, that, uh, let's say, uh, the flows of images, the networks, uh, that uh, this 3% is capable to create all of the world, this kind of technosphere, it's tremendously bigger than the 3%. But uh, what makes this 3%, uh, let's say, uh, so <laughs> even from our point of view, is uh, is that uh, this 3% uh, is uh, capable to develop uh, and to create some, uh, uh, let's say, big, big, uh, tremendous travel for the living species of the planet. So we know well, for instance, that uh, this 3% is consuming the 70% of the resources of the planet, but basically what is more important it is producing uh, the 75% of the CO2 emissions which are present in the atmosphere. On the other side, if we consider the presence of the forest and the trees in the woodlands, uh, they will not cover more than the 30%. But this uh, 30% uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, so crucial for uh, the life of the living species of the planet it's uh, implemented biodiversity, it's uh, let's say, uh, absorbing the 30% of that CO2 that the cities are producing. Uh, and uh, we know well that uh, this proportion, uh, the relation between the extension of the urban surfaces and their responsibility in creating, let's say, the causes of climate change or global warming, at uh, same time can be compensated by uh, inclusion of woodland and forest. Uh, but we know, we know well that uh, cities uh, that probably are the cause of climate change and from another point of view, they are the first victim of climate change because uh, just think to the flooding process that are, uh, let's say, in threatening uh, a lot of uh, metro coastal metropolitan environments. Uh, so we have to do our best to make uh, a city capable to take on climate change, transforming the role from cause to victim to, let's say, protagonist of a big campaign to take climate change. And from that point of view, I think that what we can do in terms of uh, redefining our relation with other media species and imagine investing in green, it's, uh, it's very important. So we know uh, this, uh, uh, what's happening and we know well that uh, there are quite a complicated eclectic literature on the relations in our and other species. But basically what is clear is what we were saying is that the extension of this 3% of the nature has changed a lot of the relation with the other. The species of the process of deforestation were so, let's say, all of what's happened and also in terms of creating the process of spillover that are the beginning of the diffusion of the contagion. And that is a, something that we know we know we know uh, quite well so i believe that from our point of view uh, we have to 
as you were saying, and uh, you're right, of course, Stefano Mancuso and Emanuele Coccia, we have to redefine our role uh, in the planet. Probably you have to also develop a new kind of anthropocentrism and are trying to make the fragility that this uh, pandemia left us as a heritage in a capacity to, let's say, uh, uh, try to put our within the eyes of the other living species to really change our perspective on the urban life. But uh, from a, another point of view, we have to invest on, on trees, on environment. Uh, trees are extremely important. Trees are, uh, let's say, reducing the uh, effects of global warming. They absorb CO2 and transform CO2 in, uh, in uh, oxygen. So uh, the more we are able to uh, multiply the number of trees in our environment, and the more we can uh, really make uh, trees capable to fight the enemy in its own field. Uh, trees are uh, absorbing the dust the multiple dust of uh, urban uh, pollution. And that has become so important in the last month because we now know that uh, the, uh, the pollution, their pollution, it's one of the causes of the intensity of the diffusion of the virus in some part of the planet in the most polluted cities. So that's another advantage and contribution that trees can but trees are also implementing the biodiversity. They are uh, reducing the act of the city, so reducing the effect of the island that many city has. And cities are also cities are in, more in general uh, able to to improve the quality of our lives. So basically, I think what to, uh, we could do, what we should do, and what in more more minimal things I try to do is to to imagine how we can uh, change our idea of, uh, of architecture and, and the green. So we have worked a lot uh, with the idea to create uh, green buildings uh, where, where it's not simply uh, to introduce green as an ornamental or decorative presence in our architecture, but what we try to do is much more, let's say, radicals. The idea is to really imagine then we can put together architecture and live in nature. So, uh, the forest, vertical forest, but we are developing different parts of the world at this character. Uh, we uh, create uh, like a unique multiple part of the organism where uh, green plants, trees, uh, uh, birds, and humans are cohabiting. And uh, that's, uh, I think it could become the starting point of a new perspective on, on, on architecture. This is what you've done in Milano and what by this is reference what we are trying to do in many other many other parts of, of Europe of the world. So it's a, as you can see, uh, this is a real presence of nature. It's not simply a decoration or a furniture design. But at the same time, I think this is something we have to do at a different scale. Uh, and uh, trying also to see how trees, plants, the environment can uh, contribute with the quality of life of uh, cities that should become more and more close to the idea of an archipelago of uh, self-sufficient uh, boroughs, self-sufficient villages, where everybody could reach uh, facilities, uh, uh, what he needs in uh, not more than 20 minutes, and where the green environment would become the protagonist of the future of our life. That's, for example, the project we developed in Mexico, and this is a kind of new forest city where more than seven millions of uh, trees and plants in every building, every space, as a presence of trees uh, uh, everywhere, has a basic contribution to what we do. So I, I believe uh, that uh, uh, this is simply one part of the future. The other is uh, that uh, it is true we have to imagine how trees move to our cities. We have also to imagine how humans move to our forests. Uh, that's the project we're developing in Italy, the idea to, to a big part. Uh, I think that the key word is connectivity. We have to connect uh, the uh, natural part, we have to connect the forest and use cities not as obstacles, but as nodes of this possible connection. You know well what's happening in, in Africa with this uh, green uh, wall that from uh, Nigeria uh, Senegal has for uh, 
thousands of miles connected and created a barrier to the extension of Sahara there into the south. So I think that model is something that to reproduce in different parts of the world. And that is something that, for instance, we are, we are developing in, in Italy. From that point of view, uh, this is simply one last image, is the, something that we are doing in Genève. We have been asked to imagine the future of Genève, to imagine an extension of the metropolitan environment. And what we have done is to create a constellation of uh, small villages that put Genève uh, in a context of a larger environment. And at the center of this uh, new idea of a metropolitan environment, we have a mountain, we have uh, animals, we have the real life. So I believe this is simply one of the way we had to, let's say we can try to change the relation between uh, uh, cities and uh, forest. Thank you so much, Nicolai. And Stefano, you thank you so much. Uh, this is really extremely impressive um, and leads me immediately to, um, uh, to our next uh, panelist, Soher. Uh, what we have seen here from Stefano, it's a reconnection. You, 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 you know that um, the word, word religion comes from the Latin word, word religare. Religare, what means reconnection, a reconnection to God in the sense of religion. Um, what Stefano showed us is the reconnection to, um, to nature. Um, maybe somebody from my team could change the view on, of the screen back to, to our normal view. Um, that is not shared screen. So perfect. Um, uh, the, we, we, we saw in the past 30 years, basically, you know, before the internet, obviously, uh, there was already an extreme um, development in computer technology that led to the internet that then since 96 completely boosted, you know, our world and our economy and also what Hans Ulrich is always referring to as production of reality. Production of reality now is possible because of computerization and because of interconnection. There's like a network uh, uh, where we are able to communicate and create virtual rooms. We can uh, meanwhile, you know, enter these rooms, even live in these rooms, meet in these rooms. Uh, so we invested an incredible amount of resources money, but maybe even more intellectual resources into creating a digital mirror, basically, of our, of our world. Um, now, this technology probably, and this is what I found so impressive with the um, deep uh, listener work from Jakob Kutz-Stensen, um, is uh, possibly this technology can reconnect us now to nature, can lead us back uh, into nature and um, we believe that culture is the necessary bridge to it because culture was since you know since we we started actually um, uh, to build to create uh, it was always a tendency against nature it was always to exclude nature to keep nature outside because nature was threatening now uh, we created a world where we are maybe one of the strongest forces of nature with our culture and now is the big question to you how your practice personally is trying to reconnect uh, working for google working on other projects trying to reconnect this realms the realm of the garden eden with the realm of you know adam and eve yeah well first of all thank you for having me uh, it's an amazing set of panelists and really interesting presentation so I would say, yes, yeah. so I've worked on Google Arts and Culture for many years. I work for Google, I work in technology, but one thing to just keep in mind is that uh, the numbers that you mentioned at the very beginning, the scope of people living in cities, the scope of people who are internally displaced within countries and moving to cities, and now this unknown of what happens after COVID, how many millions or billions of people are forced to leave cities, uh, I think goes beyond you know, what can be solved or addressed with things like technology in this moment. Um, I think what's been incredible about this pandemic, as you said, is that it, on the one hand, we're completely disconnected, but on the other hand, we've had technology to connect. This doesn't take away from the fact that we've all had very different experiences of the exact same moment in time. You know, we are very much experiencing 
nature, the world, technology on our own terms. Let's not forget that everybody has a very different level of connectivity. I'm in Pakistan right now. Um, both Karachi and Bombay have just been completely flooded. Internet is out, electricity is out, and suddenly you're actually physically alone. And one of the reasons obviously has been, it is said is climate change, is these rains are worse than ever, these floods are worse than ever. Having said that, my work has been very much at, you know, the, the nexus of the most sophisticated, I think, is how can you bring technology uh, to art, to culture, to open up new worlds. So Google Arts and Culture is an online platform where we digitize the collections of museums. We bring online the stories of curators and artists and to create more access uh, to culture from, I think, over now 80 countries around the world. Uh, we work with 2,000 cultural institutions to showcase their collections. And we also work directly with artists, like we did with Jakob, to help to bring technology to their practice. So on the one hand, we have this amazing opportunity, especially during this time of lockdown and beyond, to open up doors, to create new stories and new avenues. And Jakob's work was very much focused on climate change and this idea of nature. Um, we actually worked with him uh, to create an augmented reality experience for the first ever virtual pavilion for the Serpentine last summer. Uh, so you had the physical pavilion and then we created with him this augmented reality world where you stepped back into Hyde Park outside of the Serpentine. And this was all him, his idea. It was an application process we had hundreds of applications and our judging panel, of course, included Hans Ulrich Obrist, included Ahmed Sood from Google Arts and Culture, David Ajay, Virgil Abloh. So sort of this incredible group of people who said the augmented reality pavilion that we choose is one which engages with nature and the park. And Jakob was looking to create a world where you take your phone, you project an image or a set of images from your phone onto the ground and you're suddenly surrounded by the natural uh, environment of Hyde Park, the things we don't see. So the animals, there's a list of species of wildlife, the plants, the flora, the fauna. And suddenly we're confronted with, we're not just walking through a park in a really big city, we're looking at the tiny things that we don't notice, the things that we should be appreciating and preserving and conserving. And I do think, you know, to your point, it is, most of us are living in cities, more and more people are gonna live in cities. How can we start to come back to nature of course, it is good for our mental health, for our well-being, but equally, it's important for all of us to know what's there and what we're losing. Um, so this particular project, you could go to the Serpentine, download this app on your phone and project into the world this beautiful, magical space. There were stereoscopic sounds, so you could hear sounds around you. You had to go to a particular point in the park for... Um, uh, you know, a, an, a, an image or a vision to manifest, and then that would be your experience. It was also very, very immersive, uh, beautiful, moving, and then you put your phone away, and that's that. Obviously, now we can still go to the park, but we can't. You know, in fact, the Serpentine is just open, so you can go inside, and it's a very different experience. But I think to come back to your earlier point of you know, we are at the end of the day animals, we are of nature, we have completely disconnected from that. Maybe technology for those of us who are privileged to be able to have these experiences can open up a little bit of the, the doors that remind us and equally for young people, for students, uh, for those who feel lonely, displaced, disconnected, it's one more way of coming into that world. Yeah, totally. So I was quite fascinated um, at the opening of this show from Jakob. I was going with the phone because you have to look in the phone and then you see the augmented reality. And then suddenly I saw this amazing, uh, I first I heard actually the sound of parrots and then I saw mm -hmm. this parrots through the phone mm -hmm. and I thought like, this is incredible how realistic they are. And then I discovered this were actually realistic parrots in the Kensington Gardens. You know that there's this place with the tree where, where since, you know, like 20 years, Ben, maybe you can say something about the parrots uh, in the Kensington Gardens. Uh, you know about them, right? You, you, you are aware of, of the parrots because uh, you're on mute now. Um, I, I, know, I know a bit about them, but it's not something uh, I'm an ex expert in. But, um... so, so, so I can um, m maybe, you know, as you're the, um, the CEO, the director, the chairman of Centre of London. So I discovered the parrots through this application, but they were not part of the augmentation. They were part of the reality. <laughs> and uh, there is a place in the Kensington Gardens where you have this 100, 200 parrots. They they came uh, with the um, they came they came with uh, with with the ships by incident, and then they started to live 
probably also because of global warming, they were able to survive. And, right. and now there's a lot of people coming every day to feed these parrots. And you can see the interactions between humans and uh, animals. This is what Stefano said. This is also something that is part of Jakob Kutz-Denson's work because he's introducing new, completely new organisms in this augmented reality. But um, they are also the old organism in the real reality, uh, Ben. And, uh, and this is something that um, I think we have to bring back into the cities, as Stefano is uh, preaching almost, I have to say. I, I, agree, but I agree with yeah. that, but I think the green infrastructure is really, really important. But so is the social or the human infrastructure. So yeah, the connections between us and nature are absolutely sort of vital and, and increasingly we can see how you can do that in cities and, and, and make it meaningful. Um, but no less important are the sort of social spaces and the sort of social institutions from the streets to the parks to the libraries, um, which I think you know people appreciate more and more actually. And I, and I think it's interesting to make a distinction between urbanization and urbanism, because urbanization is something which is Know, ongoing and went on through much of the 20th century and were sort of deep you know economic drivers of that but but urbanism is a sort of movement which is about you know humanizing cities um uh, and you know in the way some ways that's a sort of more recent thing because actually you know the, uh, lots of the urbanization in the 20th century in particular was just really really poor i mean it was you know that's still ongoing to some extent but it was car dominated it was about you know zoning uh, it was often quite anti-urban, actually, in its values. I mean, it was, you know, it, it saw cities often as sort of, you know, dirty and, and unattractive places, you know, and it, it imagined towers in parks and all of that. Um, and I think really since Jane Jacobs and, and the 1960s sort of and 70s, we've seen this movement of you know, urbanism and a growth of this people who identify like me or identify themselves as urbanists. And we celebrate the city as a, something which is efficient, which is sustainable, um, which is a source of, of innovation and creativity and culture, which is cosmopolitan in, in its values. And, you know, uh, we haven't won the day at all, but, but, but we've become a sort of more powerful force. And, and, you know, there are people like me who sort of think about these things and, and work on these things for a living. But I think also, you know, amongst the general population, city dwellers, particularly in the West, um, you know, you're seeing a sort of reevaluation of the city, People, you know, wanting more shared space. Um, it's fascinating to watch the Greens, you know, win city after city in the recent French elections. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, the, the what what mayors in, ac across Europe and, and, and indeed the states are doing to sort of contain and expel the car from city centres. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this new focus on on, on parks and and livable streets and, and play streets, uh, and and you know and natural spaces and, and, and natural infrastructure and social infrastructure, um, you know, developing uh, hand in hand. Okay. What's your, yes, sorry. No, 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 I was just, I, I just wondered if I could add something because it, it's, it's in sort of polarity to what Suhair is saying, but I, I think extremely relevant and um, it's about nature and, and technology. And um, just in the last couple of weeks, I did a, a, a nature pilgrimage and um, we were out of the city, but this sort of thing could be done equally as well in a city. Um, so a group of us, uh, went to a part of the country and it was to do with um, immersion in nature and what it what it means to calibrate with nature's frequency with a 432 frequency what it does to our body field um, and it was it was really quite remarkable and um, and part of that process um, was dumping our devices um, so before the pilgrimage, our body fields were, were measured, and I'd love to hear from um, the professor or anyone else, frankly. Um, our body fields were measured, and they were all about a metre and a half, um, but when we held our phone, zero. It completely dispels our, our body field. And after 24 hours of, of, of um, you know, barefoot in camp, barefoot hiking and sleeping overnight um, in the woods, which may sound extreme, but it was, it was remarkable in, in its simplicity, actually, in, in how it um, just changed, completely changed how we all felt in such a short space of time. And um, after our 
hike in the morning, we remeasured uh, the body fields and they've grown to something like six, six, seven meters. Um, and, and that, you know, the, the, the leader was, you know, it was very predictable for him, of course, he's done it so many times. Um, but he, he was someone who'd, who'd led um, uh, um, in the Sinai Desert and, and led various royalty um, global leaders and so on, just about how important our body field is and how precious and how um, recalibrating with nature brings that back to us so quickly and so easily. So I'm sorry to, you know, sort of bring that polarity in Suhair. Um, but but it's 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 true too, you know, that that immersion in nature is so valuable to all of us <laughs> for so many different different reasons. I mean Definitely. In fact, I mean, I would say this about a museum, like if you can go, go, you know, there's no way you can say that anything should replace being mm -hmm. physically in a place. And at the end of the day, we all know that being on your phone too much is not good for you. Mm -hmm. We're all exhausted by these conversations online. So a thousand percent. Well, I, I, I should add to that, that, you know, that, that you know, my own belief is, is that um, the future of well-being will be simultaneous led by, by technology, nature, but defined by humanity. There's no way forward without technology, um, but I think nature is is right up there in you know in pole position. Professor Spitz, you were called out by Annie Hood uh, mm -hmm. to give the give the medical perspective on it, and and I you know we we, we talk, had all these talks together, and and I think uh, that's basically a very interesting perspective going from a from a very uh, rational school medical perspective that, that you went through, maybe you can give a short take on that, and then developing with this knowledge into the holistic uh, medicine uh, approach. But still staying with both legs in the scientific world. Uh, there is no esoteric things, but it's scientific. So may I have the slides, please, uh, which I prepared? And um, I give you some, just some glimpses uh, from different uh, aspects, which are all important. And um, the first thing I would like to mention is the problem, the actual pandemic, is the media. And the huge problem with the media, because the media do no longer serve us, but they use us, they misuse us. And um, you can see it also with the pandemic. Uh, maybe we have a chance to get the uh, slides. The slides, please, the slides. Yeah, it okay. looks like. So if you look to the media, there is, in the, for half a year now, there is only one topic. It's Corona. Corona, Corona, Corona. There are global deaths from John Hopkins University, almost one million. Exactly, it's impressive. But if you continue the next slide and we have a look at the statistics and official uh, data. Next slide, please. Yes, looks like good. Okay, this is our problem. It's not the viruses. It's obesity as a part of non communicable diseases. This is a drawing I'm using now for 10 years or more. You see on the right side, that's the input the lean people, the output on the left side, and in between, that's a put put. That's a German word for chicken. Yeah? So the people go to the fast food bin, and what happens? They get fat. They do not go there to become fat, but it happens they get fat. Why? Because we and the humanity changed their food environment. We have a toxic food environment, and the result is non-communicable diseases. Let's have a look at the figures of the non-communicable diseases. Next slide, please. This is very, okay, this is, should not be here, but what we see today from the cities is a desert of stone, glass, and steel. And it is good to have some living trees, and a lot of living trees are. But another aspect is we have to change our building material it has also become natural. 30% of the CO2 exposure comes from building material. If we switch to a natural material, and that is wood, if you would have a large part of constructions in the cities from the wood, we would live again in wood. And who has ever been sleeping in a wooden cabin, who knows that it's almost as good as being outside in the trees. So we go ahead with that. Yeah. World, 
Health Organization published in 2018 that non-communicable diseases is 70% of all death in the world. If you look at Germany or maybe France or Japan, it's 90%. That means 90% of the population is dying from non-communicable diseases, not from viruses, but from diseases which come by our long, wrong lifestyle. We go ahead. So here you see Corona death this year, 800,000. If you look last year, there were by infection influenza, half a million, but look at tuberculosis, 1.5 million deaths. Did you hear anything about tuberculosis in the media? Nothing. That is double the amount of death every year, but tuberculosis is not interesting. And still more, the next one on the right side is actually non-communicable diseases. Yeah? It's heart disease. 80 million people die from heart disease. Compare it to 1 million with COVID-19. But you see nothing from that in the media. Cancer, 9 million. Lung disease, 4 million. And even diabetes kills 1.6 million. Then it's double the amount of the COVID-19 deaths. But the media only push COVID-19 coronavirus. So people get completely wrong informed. They get brainwashed, they get wrong informed. They do not learn what is essential for them, but they are le learn something else. Here we go ahead. So that's a new lifestyle, which is the problem. And I'm going to show why this is this. And the cost is 1 billion alone in Germany and not per year, but per day. In Germany, we pay 1 billion euro every day for the sick people, not for health, it's only for the sick people. Next, please. So last century, a American biologist has said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And this was for me actually a very important idea. And we developed it and say today, nothing in health can make sense except in the light of evolution and environment. And that's our topic today, the extreme topic for the, our health and the environment in the light of evolution. We go ahead. I have had this um, picture for many years now and it shows our evolution. And if you look at the left side, you have on the top, you have the sun, which we lost almost completely. There is almost no sun in the cities. And below that, you have some small viruses, some small bacteria. They were the first living creatures on this world. And please do not believe that they vanished. They are still here. They are dominating our planet. And all the other um, creatures which came had to live with them together. And also the human body is not able to live on its own. He is living together with one or 2.5 kilogram of these bugs and bacteria. So we are unable to live without them. We live in a symbiosis and it's a stupid idea to declare a war to the bacteria and viruses. We have to find a measure to live with them and nature did it. We got an immune system and this immune system was um, tuned and is today perfect to handle the symbiosis with the viruses, but only if the immune system and our body gets the necessary resources. If the resources are not there, it does not work. Please go ahead. The problem comes now um, when the humans were able to develop uh, tools and to start to change the world. So it was agriculture, which was the first step for civilization. And we have to say, that's the dark side of the Anthropocene. We are so proud that we have now put our stamp on the uh, earth, but it's a dark side. And this is all our problem with the diseases. But let's go back to um, the uh, evolution side. If we look to the next uh, slide, what we see there before agriculture started, there was something else. I do not know whether you ever saw that. 
And there's another picture below that. And if you make it bigger in the next picture, what do we see? We see the culture of arts. 20,000, 30,000 years ago, that was done off the left side, this flute, it has been done all out of a bone of a bird. And most of you know this uh, drawings in the French caves. That means 20,000 years before agriculture started, we had the culture of arts. And the question is, what happened to this culture? What happened to the human species that they switched from the culture of art to the culture of agriculture? Completely different. And we lost this uh, very important development of evolution. We lost it by concentrating on agriculture and civilization. Please go ahead. The reason why the um, environment is so important is that we learned some 20 years ago that our genes are actually the blueprint of us. In the genes, all the knowledge of the evolution is written together, but the genes are unable to give this information to the cell, the cell has to read this information and it does it by epigenetics. That are tools to be able for the cell to read the genes. And the curious thing is that these tools come as a part from inside, but go back plan, please. Uh, many of them come from outside. You see cigarette smoke, you see the financial stress, you see the microbiome, you see social interaction, all these influences in our environment have an influence on the epigenetics that mean how the um, cells are able to control their genes. And on top, you see the diet. In the diet, there are hundreds of thousands of um, micronutrients which the cell needs to use the genes. And today we are eating a food which has a high amount of calories but it's almost void of micronutrients. That means our body is in lack of tools he need to work. And if he has a lack of these tools, he gets weak in his organ function and we become sick. So it's the, the, the mismatch between the resources of our environment, which we need and the uh, work of our body that we getting sick, that we get chronic disease, non communicated diseases. Go ahead. Professor Spitz, can I interrupt you for one moment here and go back to the other mode because uh, of our time? Yeah. Um, uh, it's a perfect moment to make a point. If we can go back to the other screen yeah. form. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for this insights because I think, and we will come back to this, but what I wanted uh, the panelists and, and, and also our uh, audience uh, to recognize here is that basically the, the question what we eat is basically dominating uh, all the design of our cities because it's also it's also dominating the design of uh, our you know when you go with the airplane over our countries you see the design the cultivation of the land so basically uh, the decision for example to eat meat leads automatically to much more surface that needs to be covered with soya leads also to completely different urban designs leads to to a whole supply chain that is basically not only destroying the planet, but also destroying ourselves, like Professor Spitz shown and uh, showed. And COVID-19 is a very good example indeed, that it's basically affecting, um, that it's basically affecting uh, first and foremost, uh, the people that have preconditions. Yeah? So basically the, the um, weak body that is a pro pro product of our culture, yeah, this is uh, Jane Witters, why I, how I wanted to, to build the bridge in new direction because uh, uh, culture um, uh, is something Professor Spitz mentioned it and uh, Annie Hood mentioned it too and, uh, and um, so had mentioned it, uh, that culture is something that uh, we are constantly producing that is created basically to, uh, to keep us alive but it can also uh, work in exactly the other direction. Um, and uh, we are now in a situation to recognize that our culture probably led us into a direction that, uh, 
that we will not be able to sustain as an organism. And uh, Jane, you worked a lot uh, with, um, with the topics of nature, with the topics of water also, especially, which is an extremely important part of both of our culture and of our nature and of the nature of everything. And um, I would like your take on what uh, Professor Spitz just showed in the context of the human city. Uh, how, how we can um, create a culture that will uplift our organism. And do, do you think this is something, this is a debate that we can basically, that we can basically um, uh, push? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the intersection of nature, culture is um, absolutely critical to how we look at our cities and sort of bring it together in a holistic view. And that's what I thought was interesting about the Human Cities paper in particular. Um, and within that, I was actually going to share some projects that we've done recently, if I could have my presentation, please, or thoughts about water in cities. We've been talking about nature, a lot about trees and so on, and it's been fascinating. But I think that also water is a dimension that can be brought in. And we talk a lot about blue space in cities, but much less about green space. Yet we often positioned our site in our cities to be next to water for many different reasons for um, transport, hydration, agriculture, defense, but also well-being, spirituality, ritual, and so on. Um, but in the sort of last hundred years or so, I don't know if any of you read a wonderful book called Water and Forgetfulness by Ivan Illich. It's just a sort of short essay, but he talks about how we've exiled water from our lives and turned it into this industrial fluid that we sort of ignore. Um, and I wanted to, in the last year, we did a program in, in New York, actually, called Water Futures, bringing together designers and architects and scientists and specialists, other specialists on water to work together to look at how we can reintegrate water culture. Um, and this was an exhibition we did a few years ago called Urban Plunge, and it shows a project which I think began in the 90s, but is actually being realized now I think the funding and the planning has been secured um, in the center of Berlin and it's about bringing water uh, swimming back and it's a disused shipping canal that's I think nearly two kilometers long and the swimming stretch will be one kilometer um, and the rest are reed bed filtering the water so you get naturally purified river water but I think it's part of a movement to look as a different kind of human well-being culture in cities that's so fascinating. Imagine you know, if you put your body in a city, you want to know what, sorry, and water, you want to know what it's like, it's pollution. It's a great barometer of nature's health in general. Um, you know, why should cities be polluted, uh, water, river cities be polluted sewers? Why can't they be clean again? Um, so I think this movement is an absolutely fascinating way of looking at cities. And sorry, the next slide, I'll show you a couple more examples. Um, could we move to the next image? Great. I think the sort of movement of wild swimming began, or urban swimming began 15 years or so ago when um, Copenhagen cleaned its industrial port for leisure. Um, and I think, as you were saying, um, Annie, or, and Jörg, you mentioned um, recent uh, studies of nature and cities and well-being. And I think it's fascinating, the NHS have just done a Blue Gym um, study. I think it's called Blue Gym in the UK. And it was being discussed on the radio the other day that doctors might be prescribing cold water swimming. And it was sort of dis discussed as though there was some real surprise at this. But of course, there's, you know, 19th century like um, well-being theories, you know, there's a long history of this. But I think sometimes we need to go back to kind of vernacular understandings and so forth. Um, the next one, please. Um, this is another of Copenhagen task for bars where it's all about expanding the waterfront so you get more, uh, making it, it's the river accessible for people um, rather than just being either sewers or motorways for boats. Um, and the next one, please. 
Um, this is something that hasn't happened yet in London, but is a wonderful proposal for swimming by Blackfriars, a series of baths in the Thames. But it also shows how, they, uh, how water could sort of reintroduce bi biodiversity into the city through these sort of small touches that can have, um, I think, larger impact. Um, and the next one. Oh, yeah, this is a very different um, water project um, by the Dutch architects Ouse for Chennai. And I think this is fascinating because it's a very different approach to water culture. Chennai, Chennai, probably some of you know, last year faced its own version of Cape Town's day zero when the city was going to run out of water, quite literally. Um, and I think the rains came in July, halfway through the year, and it was just about saved. Um, but it's given them a very different approach to the water infrastructure for the city. And this is a project, City of a Thousand Tanks is being trialed. And basically it goes back to, from the sort of centralized infrastructure to look at the temple tanks in the city. Could we go on to the next slide, please? Um, and India, I don't know if you know about historic step wells um, and temple tanks to collect water and make rain welcome in the city and sort of celebrate it. Um, and the slide we saw before was showing how these temple tanks can be brought together in a green network um, that will um, both clean and collect water rather than sort of being unwelcome as it is at the moment. And the final slide. Um, and so these are the bias, bias whales. This is the current situation on the left and what they could be on the right through the housing and connecting um, different neighborhoods through water infrastructures. I mean, I think this is, the reason I want to show this project is it's got a very, for well-being in the city, this nature-based um, approach and making um, infrastructures visible again, because we've made water invisible um, and environments are hostile to it. Um, so that's sort of where I'm coming from for the well-being aspect. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, I think we all agree that water is um, something that reconnects us to nature because it is a very strong force of nature and it's in all living beings. Uh, uh, it has also um, something that it shares with all living beings, but it's also a very precious uh, good now. Um, we, we have to learn that, that water is something that uh, is a social, um, uh, it's a social, uh, it has a social dimension. And Danny, I wanted to, uh, to um, have you maybe introduce the social dimension of cities. We, we heard now about the you know, healthcare impact. We heard a lot about the cultural impact. This all, uh, Ben mentioned actually the social dimension of, of cities and city planning. Um, but what is in your uh, opinion and in your personal work also and experience also listening to this panel, um, the social dimension that, that should be highlighted? Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you for hosting this discussion. It feels uh, really timely. And I don't think, you know, I, I grew up in a rural part of Sri Lanka and in Papua New Guinea and only moved to a city when I was a teenager and have since lived only in cities in New York, in London, in Johannesburg, in Sydney. And but not until the last six months have I ever really felt um, the reality of living in a city because of having been to, you know, stuck at home, working from home or living at work, depending on how you want to, how you see it. And I've become, I suppose, really conscious and I suspect all of us have, I think Annie, you put it really well about um, the sort of, you know, being, feeling trapped in, 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 our, in our spaces in, in cities. And, so COVID, I think, is a, um, is a wake up call in so many ways for me and particularly in the in the work that we do at Oxfam. I think it's it's brought to life the sort of deep inequalities that we see across the world. And, you know, in a city like London, where I where I sit, I'm really conscious of of, of just the you know, physical inequality of access to space that people have. And I see it in my own work. And we have several thousand employees in Oxfam. Many of us have the luxury of a room that we can sit in and, and sort of isolate ourselves from our families, but many don't and um, don't have the privilege of being able to, to live and, and survive, thrive, if you will, viably in, in a city environment or, or in, in wherever they have. Um, 
but also I think to to, to Ben's point and, and many other people's point that you know th this is a pandemic that has thrown into sharp relief the the real inequalities between the people we may live next door to who we have limited interactions with but you know whose life and life chances have been transformed as a as a result of of the disruption of this pandemic and I see it really clearly in in the work that we do with urban poor in uh, in developing countries. You know, I, I read in your uh, I read in your green paper this startling statistic that you know only four percent of all of the billions of humans that have ever lived have lived in a city, but our projections suggest that in by 2030, one in four humans who will live on the planet will live in an urban slum. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, although living in a city is relatively new to humankind, it's not only going to be prolific, but it's going to be prolific for the poorest of the world. Uh, and it already is. And if you think of COVID-19, and I suppose this is a, a point similar to the point Professor Spitz was making, uh, you know, if you happen to be living in an urban um, mm -hmm. slum today and you're facing COVID restrictions and lockdown, your life chances are almost, you know, are, are unimaginably worse than they were um, before COVID and compared to your rural compatriots. Um, you know, this was brought home to me very clearly with a, from a text message, an SMS that a colleague received from a taxi driver in Nairobi at the early days of the pandemic. And this is a taxi driver he normally uses when he visits Nairobi. And the taxi driver simply said, this virus will starve us before it infects us. And this is the reality. You know, we, we think that more people will die as a result this year of starvation caused by the disruption to supply chains and to our food systems than will actually die of the infection itself. Yeah. And that's, you know, in particular, if you think of urban environments, I mean, in Uganda, 80% of the workforce is informal. They don't have access to tax systems and fiscal remedies that most of us have have some sort of access to. They also don't have the access necessarily to a, a, a sustainable food supply uh, chain. And so I think we have, you know, we live in a time in a moment of human history where we really have to grapple with both the well-being of those of us who live in, a, in cities like London or Berlin or you know, other amazing places, but also grapple with the reality that we live in a time of huge inequity um, and that the life chances of our fellow human beings who happen to be in urban areas in other parts of the world are, were already pretty bad, but this pandemic has made life uh, you know, even more uh, difficult. And then I suppose if you overlay on that where Stefano started us with and, and look at the sort of intergenerational aspects of that inequality, the fact that we are eating our future, literally, um, then it's a sort of triple conundrum to, to of well-being. How do we make sure that each of us can thrive in the in relatively affluent urban areas? What are our responsibilities to others who are less well off? And then, of course, what are our responsibilities to future generations of human beings? Um, so this is a, a really fantastic and timely conversation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. This I really, the, you know, this I think this perspective that that you open up uh, is a very uh, it's, it's actually uh, maybe the most important perspective because uh, as we said before that uh, COVID-19 showed us that we are so much connected with everybody else that basically you cannot be well off if somebody next to you is not well off. I mean, it's just an illusion probably uh, over you know a, a short amount of time, but already your children will be affected if we cannot solve the problem of poverty by 100%. And uh, Stefano, you started uh, this with the presentation and uh, there was one, one thing that uh, especially um, came uh, in the presentation uh, and into my mind that's also part of our uh, green paper that you want to create within cities uh, autonomous almost um, self-sustained uh, places where people can um, can live their life they have space to live their life but they have also space to create micro supply chains and uh, urban farming is here a very big topic so that greenery is not only a uh, a decoration or a, a, a 
park, but it's also uh, our food supply. We can't forget that actually, if you move to the countryside, um, uh, the, the earth is um, delivering to us almost everything uh, what what we need to survive. It's, you mentioned Papua New Guinea that, that I was happy to visit uh, some uh, time before COVID-19 actually. And it's incredible when you are in these places that are so full of nature and where nature is basically giving you everything, you know? So, uh, and also I think Stefano, um, if we would uh, switch to the plant-based um, uh, food supply chain, there wouldn't be any problem to, you know, to have everybody fed. Uh, and our productivity with the technology we have developed is also so high that there's no problem anymore of producing and uh, distribution. But the problem I think that we have is a design problem. How we design this, that is still based on a free market economy, but that is producing what we need and not mostly what we don't need. Because uh, I think this is another lesson that we took from COVID is that there's so many things we don't really need. Yeah. But there's so many things that so many people really need to survive, uh, basically. And uh, this is also a big inequality that the uh, system is producing so many things, so many spaces, so many goods, so many transactions that are absolutely not necessary, while it's not producing at the same time things that are absolutely necessary to survive, also for us. Yeah. Also, Ben, if you like to jump in, uh, Stefan, that but you, you both have to demute because it's... Yeah, I, it's going to be very interesting to what extent COVID does, um, what effect it has on sort of dominant models of urbanization, you know, because we have sort of seen you know, the re-urbanization of our economies in the last sort of 20 or 30 years, as we've moved to an industrial, to a service economy, in a way that no one, I mean, we're, you know, I'm old enough to remember when you know, the digital revolution started and you know, the best bet people were predicting it would all end up working in sort of huts in the forest or huts in the, in the, in the hills because we could all communicate remotely and quite the opposite happened. You know, places like New York and London, San Francisco, you know, Paris and elsewhere sort of boomed, often leaving their nations and their sort of poorer regions behind. Um, Richard Florida talked about, you know, um, not the world is flat, but the world is spiky. And the spikes were these sort of, you know, large global cities, which attracted all the investment, all the talent, uh, you know, so much of the sort of creativity and, and culture. Um, and it, it might be the case uh, that actually COVID does change that dynamic a bit and, and, and people use cities and relate to cities in a slightly different way. And so we do spend more time working at home or working in, in local neighborhoods. Uh, um, and what will that mean for cities? It, it, there's, a, there's a sort of rosy future actually where they become much richer things because when you go into them, you're going to them not for a routine reason, but to do something special. Um, but there's also a sort of, I guess, a slightly more dystopian version of it, which is, you know, they just lose their, their buzz, they lose their edge, uh, and they lose their vitality and the creativity that we associate with, with cities. And I think it's an open question of, of, of which one of those we're heading for. Yeah, I mean, you, you have the situation now um, in the United States coming all together, like with the social unrest that uh, mm -hmm. there's not only a racial issue, but I think that is very much also a social issue um, because it's basically underprivileged uh, uh, communities that, uh, that were left behind. And um, uh, this is, I think, exactly the point that Danny was uh, making, that... Uh, we have these communities not only uh, in our countries, no, but we have them also in our countries, where like London, uh, cities like London, cities like Berlin, uh, we will have to deal with big migration flows also. So uh, it's in our own interest, uh, and anyways, in our own interest to to create uh, solutions. And very much, you know, because I, I think we can create these solutions only when we accept that culture was uh, something that created, uh, co-created this problem, created a lot of solutions, but, uh, but culture became something that is, uh, that is basically a non-essential, uh, you know, all the cultural workers, the creative workers are non-essential workers in times of COVID, but we forget that the last time we reacted um, as humanity uh, to changed uh, social dynamics, uh, after the Manchester capitalism was uh, introducing industrialization, it was Bauhaus 
that helped us to recreate our cities. Yeah, it was a movement that was actually a cultural movement, not political, not uh, you know entrepreneurial. It was uh, a movement that was redesigning uh, from a very holistic perspective, from the you know spoon of tea up to uh, housing and uh, urban planning. And this kind of movement is now uh, lacking. Um, uh, and um, with the knowledge and technology we have, uh, and also speaking about technology, uh, so yeah, I, I think that um, uh, you know companies like Google, for example, that did amazingly well to improve our lives. You know, uh, for example, the ability to get information, to get access. Uh, also to spread information and access to people that otherwise never would have the chance to visit a library, for example. Basically, the infrastructure is there to uplift with information what Professor Spitz mentioned, you know, to give the people the right tools, to have the right knowledge, to prepare themselves, to, you know, to give them the blueprints, to send them via internet, you know, without having to send papers, to have to send books. To, so, so the ability for us to to, to spread knowledge that, that helps to create cities and communities that are more you know, sustainable and more just, um, I think is, uh, is something where I, I personally have the feeling, but, but please, um, if you could elaborate on this, uh, we have not enough cooperation between the real estate, the real uh, economy uh, that is basically uh, not uh, yet digital or that is about creating our physical space, and the digital economy that could uh, help people really to uh, to recreate their communities with with the means of technology. Yeah, so I think it's a really exciting and positive moment for more collaboration and more partnerships. I think there's an onus and an impetus on all technology companies now to say, we have this data, it is accessible, how do we get it to the right people? Is it through partnerships with cultural institutions, with educational institutions? Um, we have just announced a collaboration with the World Wildlife Fund on a new environmental platform to think about the environmental impact of textiles and raw materials. Nothing can be done in a vacuum. And I think that, yes, there's, you know, you know, I mentioned the Google Arts and Culture Project, there's 7 million artworks online. How do you get those stories? How do you get that information into the hands of the people who would benefit most from it? It doesn't just happen uh, by serendipity. Of course, the amazing thing about the internet is that there is a lot of serendipity, but now the next step is you know, pushing towards providing this information to the right people. And the second thing I think is thinking about the idea of community. We've talked about this a lot in this conversation, I think the words we've been using for the last six months are not world changing, you know, sort of, it's about cultures, communities, clusters. We use the word cluster all the time. And so how can we think about how to bring technology back to communities to benefit them, to allow them to connect in a way that feels like you're actually bringing people together in a way that comes back to what you said, the real you know, you can't invent just entire planets of communities online. You have to think about what already exists and how we can help to support them. So I think the, the tools are there, even with cities. You know, there are probably the tools to think about which cities work, which cities are more diverse, which cities are more inclusive, which cities are coping well with COVID in terms of resources and dealing with inequality and crossing the divides. And how do we use tools like artificial intelligence to bring that information to city leaders, community leaders. We obviously can't rebuild everything today, but equally I think for all of us, it would be very sad to see cities die out. To your point, culture comes you know, in so many ways from cities and over time and over centuries and millennia. So I think that's another way that technology can be used in a positive way is to look at cities and to think about not just culture, but really the logistics of it uh, and to, to provide solutions in a way that's thoughtful, maybe a bit slower, maybe that requires a bit more time and energy uh, and is not just about, you know, pressing a button and allowing something into the world. And I think this is a great moment to create that incentive for all these organizations to, to lean into that also. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, what you said with uh, what, what I find totally interesting and what actually um, also, uh, because the knowledge aspect, to spread knowledge in communities, uh, Professor Spitz mentioned to live in wooden houses is a much better experience than to live in concrete. Concrete is also creating 30% of the CO2 emissions, or not concrete, but building materials in general. 
any uh, you mentioned this experience in being in nature and like completely you know diving into the nature and basically hugging the tree and then feeling this energy i find this very interesting because this is an experience and and then you mentioned the slum the slum is actually something very uh, interesting basically because it's 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 not in the nature, but it's also not really in the city. It's something in between. It's basically something that has not the resources of the city. This is why it's very, very bad, but actually it's very bad because the people are not in the nature. The nature, the experience of nature, if you can access it, if you can live in it, you know, is actually, well, paradoxically, uh, for free, you know? So basically you could be in nature for free but uh, still, this is most probably the most uh, unaccessible experience for most of the poor people because they are actually living in slums that have no access to nature. What is a paradox itself? Because uh, because probably with uh, with a different form of design, we could recreate much cheaper, uh, you know, living environment with animals, as Stefano is proposing. Uh, maybe more uh, countryside-like uh, that uh, would um, cost less resources. I mean, microfinancing showed us how effective it can be if free market, you know, uh, standards are applied to, to um, that are really applied. So there's really money dedicated to it. So we really invest money into this kind of designs and we give these people, this is something that Jaden said in our last talk, uh, uh, that it's extremely important that people have ownership, that people have something that belongs to them and that they can really take care for this, that a city is not a product of real estate developers actually that are creating your reality, but that this reality is created by yourself. Maybe Danny, what is your take on, on you know, the individual uh, responsibility and the, the possibility to give the people this responsibility, to give them also the resources. What do you think would be necessary to make uh, out of this slum um, um, citizens owners of, uh, of a property that they could take care for? Yeah, look, I think there is huge potential and we should recognize that, you know, pre-COVID, the last few decades have been a period of, of huge progress for humanity. I mean, we have more people have come out of extreme poverty in the last two decades than any uh, or most economists and other analysts would have predicted. Um, the job wasn't complete and sadly COVID disruption may well push more people back into poverty. In fact, Oxfam analysis suggests half a billion more people will be pushed into extreme poverty as a result of the long-term impacts of this pandemic. Um, but I, you know, I remain optimistic. I think that you know the the pre-COVID experience suggests that human progress is possible, and especially if it's linked, as you say, uh, to you know capital assets of whatever form that people can then build their own resilience and their own families' resilience with. And I think that's the sort of long-term ideal that we need to we need to think about. And of course, couple that with sustainability so that again they you know they have opportunity but collectively we are living up to our responsibilities towards a more sustainable future um, and you know i think that's whether it's land reform whether it's being creative about cash transfer programs whether it's being you know promoting true gender equality to correct the gender pay gap you know wherever i look there are these injustices that have stopped people from living their full potential um, but just as you can recognize those injustices, you can also recognize the solutions that will remove those obstacles. And I think that is the moment, you know, I, I increasingly am, am, am thinking about, you know, how do we make this a just recovery from this pandemic? What, you know, it, it transform everything that we do, whether that's, you know, the way we think about well-being in our own lives or the way we think about global inequality. Um, if we don't use this opportunity uh, to build towards that just recovery, I think historians will look at our generations of humans and think, you know, we really did an injustice to, to the future. And so I think that's our responsibility, especially those of us who are in positions of leadership or thought leadership of influence to push for a truly just recovery. I mean, well, 
Sorry. Nice to hear, but I'm skeptic. Very, <laughs> very good. That's a... Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, your ideas are correct, very correct, but um, huge problem. Let us see what happens until the end of this year. I mean, if I may, I, I think we're starting yes. to see a bit of evidence already. Um, um, I'd like to think certainly that, that Mother Nature would be a, a long-term beneficiary from this pandemic, but I think we're already seeing a, a um, shift in investment focus um, towards um, the planet and indeed humanity. And, and just a, a sort of a small, but, but I think relevant grassroots example, um, I'm involved in a, in, a, in a bid for one of the um, UK cities. Um, it's, it's a very large bid, but um, the, 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 the social value of everything within it, it's, it's construction, but it has um, various health and well-being elements to it. And the focus, I've never seen um, such a focus on um, the social value balance and, and, and putting tangible numbers to that. Um, how nature is intended to be uh, wound into this um, construction, how um, social equity is, is being, um, you know, pursued in, in a much more, dare I say, responsive way rather than um, half-hearted strategy, if I, can, if I can put it that way. So, Danny, I, I really do think that some changes are happening. I, I, I think, unfortunately, we're, we're all in the midst of, you know, political and geopolitical um, issues. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I, I am seeing um, some shifts firsthand that give me encouragement and, 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 you know, give me cause, you know, for optimism. So um, I, I can maybe uh, connect to this uh, with the example of the German Schrebergarten or the Dacha in, um, in Russia. So coming from Poland, uh, where until 89, we were living in an unfree society, also without resources. Everybody basically had this little piece of land with the little wooden house, actually, Professor Spitz, uh, with his own garden, because this was the only place where you could actually get fresh uh, vegetables, <laughs> because you couldn't buy them, because the, the socialistic economy wasn't able to produce enough uh, um, and distribute it also. So everybody basically spent a lot of time. This was the same for the GDR. This was the same for Czechoslovakia, the same in Poland, the same in Russia. Everybody needed to have this little, um, very simple house with a very simple garden where a, a lot of garden work was done. And, um, and I remember when my parents uh, first time moved um, uh, to Germany and uh, and they had this um, this vegetables from the from the supermarket where you have thousands of you know of different sorts and also uh, I think it was a pork schnitzel and suddenly you know the pork schnitzel in the pan was full of water and they wouldn't understand why why the the, the meat I mean we had almost no meat and we had also no vegetables in the shops but but the vegetables we had grown and uh, the meat we, we got you know once a month from uh, from the hunter uh, was extremely high quality where well, everything we could buy in germany in west germany was was absolutely low quality because the meat there was uh, water added to it uh, and the vegetables were imported from holland where they are as you know mass produced and this kind of you know um, uh, ha having his own supply chain having his own you know space that you can basically take care for and where you are you know when children this is maybe a cultural aspect to this when children are drawing a house they are always drawing an individual house with an individual facade with an individual garden where the house becomes a part of their own body you know, a part of their own expression. This is not something everybody knows that, you know, bought an apartment or rented an apartment and then had to do the interior design. So we, we know that this is something that everybody wants to create for himself, his own space, his own environment. And uh, there, you know, it's one of the biggest businesses in the world, the real estate sector that we are working in. Um, but this is actually creating these environments for the people and maybe maybe sometimes less is more and uh, is even more healthy. I don't know if this Professor Spitz would, would be something that you would 
um, agreed to coming from Germany, it knowing be, the Strebergarten. It would be extremely good to have it. My family would have starved after the Second World War if we had not a garden, a small garden, and was intensively working on that. And again, all these resources got lost in the big cities because there's no room for ha to have a garden. And if you have to drive 30 kilometers outside for a piece of uh, place where you can work, it doesn't <coughs> So it's a huge task we have to do to reintroduce the necessary resources to live healthy in a city. It will be a huge task to do that. But on the other hand, as we heard, the more and more people are going to the cities, to the metropoles, we have to do that because otherwise it will decompensate completely. Yeah, no, I, I believe, can, can I add something so that uh, is in Europe, for instance, we don't have only big cities and let's say single family houses. We simply don't have the sphere of the urban environment and the sphere of the countryside. We have a constellation of uh, historical rural villages. And I believe that this is and will become for us an amazing resource to rethink a different way to, let's say, delocalize the urban life in a different environmental context. So I believe this is an amazing opportunity. We have to do our best to avoid dispersion, sprawl, and we have to do our best to imagine that, uh, well, we have to regenerate our cities, but at the same time, we could start to think how to rehabit this constellation of small historical villages that are, for instance, in France or in Germany or in Italy, part of them are more or less completely abandoned. So I believe the city is, is something which is uh, connected with the concept of intensity. City is made by the density of spaces and by the variety of cultures. So uh, the, 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 the idea, the, the, this topic idea of uh, Imagine that we are going back to the 80s where we had this, uh, let's say, tragic phenomenon of dispersion sprawl in, in the States and in Europe. It's for me really, uh, well, <laughs> such a bad scenario. We do our best to imagine to kind of reciprocity between cities, big cities, and this constellation of small centers that were cities. In the history of Europe, they were places where the urban life were open. So. I, I believe that's another, another, another very important uh, um, way to, to start to consider this attention. Stefano, thank you very much. Um, uh, Danny already had to leave because he is on another panel uh, that starts, uh, I think, now. So um, I want to uh, thank you all, but I cannot let you go without a last question that I would like uh, everybody of you to answer. We are collecting sent sentences for our well-being city manifesto that will be uh, based on the human city project and i would like everybody of you just to say the sentence that for you would be the most important one to um to to integrate in such a manifesto if you if you could you know reduce it to one sentence stefano as as you were just talking could you give me this one sentence from your side well i'm saying that I think last time was that imagine that humans should go to our forest and trees to our cities. Well, today I think I, think, I believe that what if we imagine it's that probably we have to reimagine cities as archipelagos of villages, and we have to imagine villages as small cities. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you very much. Ani, Ani, can you give us a sentence for the manifesto from your side? Um, surely. Um, for me, it would be the future of well-being will be simultaneously driven by nature and technology, but defined by humanity. Thank you so much. It's very beautiful. Thank you. So here, from your side, please. I would say that for cities to survive and continue to thrive and grow, we need to focus on community and bringing people together. Perfect. Thank you so much also for your participation. Ben, what would be your take? But you have to demute.
building on what uh, Suhir said, I think, you know, start with the public spaces, the, 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 the places where people connect socially and build your city around those, whether big or small. Super, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, Professor Spitz, what would be your... I think the big challenge will be to rehumanize the city. The city has to become species specific. The city has to offer all the resources we need because otherwise it will be COVID-19 or the sugar and the food or whatsoever, which is going to kill us. We have to rebuild an environment which is species specific, human specific environment, and then it will be no problem to live in there happy and healthy a long life. Thank you very much. Jane, what is your um, sentence? Well, it's touching on a lot of what we said, but it's going back to put a sort of equitable access to ac access to nature at the heart of the neighborhood and the community and the future city, but also focusing this on regenerative systems. Um, so it's often going away or reimagining many of the systems we have at the moment. Thank you very much. So I want to thank you all very much. Uh, I would, uh, my wish would be that that we stay connected and you know that we will, um, and uh, that we are really uh, not only talking but building the next um, the city, the city of of the future. I think this is the right moment to do it. Uh, it's as Danny said, timely and. Uh, now we can also maybe one of the arguments we all have now uh, towards the other side uh, that wants to stick with the usual what what already you know what uh, what was always done a certain way is that it didn't work out you know when we have to close down our societies when we have to shut down our economy it means we really have to change because uh, there is no gain in, in in going forward in the same way. Uh, I want to thank all the um, many, many people that, that tuned in uh, on the different channels. And I also want to announce our next Wellbeing uh, Culture Forum that will happen in Berlin. It will be partly uh, virtual, but partly we will transform it already into the, the real space of the Gallery of Johann König, parallel to the Gallery Weekend uh, from the 11th to the 13th of September in this magnificent Bauhaus uh, Brutalist Church uh, that uh, is host of the König Gallery. We will have on three consecutive days, 11th, 12th and 13th of September, uh, talks uh, titled From Breaking Bauhaus to Growing Gaia, connecting to the ideology and idea of James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis that were introducing the symbiotic planet and the Gaia hypothesis uh, that uh, sees our planet as one living organism and all of us as a part of it. From this perspective, uh, we want to see how we can um, propose new solutions for cities. And I would be very happy to see you all again. And, uh, and um, I want to express again a very, very big thank to you for participating in this session. Thank you very much. And uh, paper, the green paper, Human Cities, is available for download on our website, Thermal Group dot com or thermal art. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.